Hi, I'm Eric Postowski. Welcome to another segment of EP on EP. Today we have actually uh, a repeat. Dr. Hugh Calkins, who uh, you all know, and he is the uh, professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University and also director of the EP program there. Uh, Hugh, welcome again to the show. All right. Well, thank Always you, Eric. It's great you. to be back. So, uh, Hugh has done a lot of work on the guidelines for AFib, and uh, there's an update that's, uh, that of the, of the guidelines. So, what I'd like to do is to get you to fill us in. So, why don't you walk us through the key new findings that are going to come out? <clears throat> Just uh, as an update, the last... ACC, AHA, HRS, AFib guidelines were published in 2014. And obviously things change quickly in this field, so the ACC, the AHA, and HRS decided to have a focus update, not a complete rewrite, but a sort of a tune-up based on some ch changes. And it's really all based on published literature and published data you know, that's come out since then. But there are a number of important things to be aware of. The first is that the the chads vast score, which we all are quite aware of, the gender has been eliminated from that. So now, if you, in order to recommend anticoagulation, you know, it's two if you're a man, three if you're a woman. Similarly, if you're, if you're a chads vast of one if you're a man and two if you're a woman, that's anticoagulation can be considered. Okay. So it basically, it basically is based on the literature saying that female gender is really not a critical stroke risk factor, and that was recognized. Rather than change the Chad's vast score, they've sort of, you know, you know neutered uh, the, the, you know, the guidelines. <laughs> that's you know, an interesting that. way of putting it, yes. So I think that's... You know, so, that's so let me interrupt you yeah. one thing, because as you know, I served on the first two guidelines, and we considered gender, uh, and we never thought it should be put into the system. Um, I never understood why the, the next group did, but I'm delighted they took it out. So... They, they took it out, I presume, because after re-looking at the data, it was not considered a strong enough risk factor? Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, good. So that was number one. Number two is now NOAX are recommended over warfarin. You know, they, they looked at all the body of data, which is enormous, and said that they're preferred. So it really pushes us towards use of NOAX unless you have valvular AFib. So one of the other things they changed is they clarified the definition of valvular AFib, and they said it means you got a prosthetic valve or severe mitral stenosis. If you have a you know tissue valve or whatever, that's not valvular okay. AFib. It's just so it's made that a lot easier. So that's, that's good. So let me clarify that too, only because it, it, it's often, as you well know, it's often an insurance issue with uh, people who are at least in our country Medicare um, that that even though they might want to be on one of the DOACs, they don't have an opportunity because it's too expensive. So in the guidelines, are they both still a 1A, but with a preference to, to the NOACs? Yes. Or you didn't drop warfarin to like a 1B or something? No, no, no. It basically says anticoagulation should be recommended, list all the NOACs and okay. warfarin. But it says, it basically, the data supports that NOACs are really superior to warfarin. And we should push our patients in that direction, if assuming they, they can afford it. If they can afford right. it, and their preferences and values. So okay. that's good. That's a change. A third change is that now weight loss is recommended in AFib patients with a recommendation to get their BMI down to 27. And we're all aware of the data from Prash Sanders and right. group. Really, you, you know that that you know I think again is a data-driven point. The other change is that the Watchman is officially included in the guidelines. In 2014, it wasn't FDA approved, and they can't put anything in the guidelines that, is, that isn't FDA approved. So Watchman wasn't included in the 2014 guidelines. Now it's included as a 2B recommendation, you know, in you know, in patients that are that are have contraindications to okay. being on warfarin long term. So that's that's a change. Another change is, is they focused on some new data that's come out at the time of cardioversion looking at stroke risk. And we all know the old rule that if you have had AFib or flutter less than 48 hours, you know, the guidelines always said you can cardiovert the patient without a TEE, without pre-procedure anticoagulation. There's some new studies basically saying that at the time of cardioversion, there's a little bump up in stroke risk. And basically when that patient comes in, get them anticoagulated before the cardioversion as quick as you can, get, have them swallow a, a NOAC or, or you know, give them some low molecular weight heparin before you cardiovert them, particularly if their stroke risk profile is elevated. So, so let me ask you a little bit about that. I'm actually quite happy with that because I've moved to that uh, previously because their data have been published in the last couple of years that suggested if you've gone at, 
beyond 12 hours. If I, the, if I remember the literature right on this, you already have a bump up in stroke risk. But here's the bigger question there. So you start them on that. Are you obligated to keep them on it for a month uh, as, as you might have if it, was a, if it was somebody who was otherwise would need it? Or, or is it like just cover the period of time? Yeah. Well, first it makes the point, which is if someone has a Chad's Vask of two if you're a man, three if you're a woman, you and anyway. they come in with AFib and they're being anticoagulated and the AFib has lasted for 12 hours, get them anticoagulated. And by the way, they should be anticoagulated. For and I'm okay with that. Let's talk yeah. about, but let's talk about people you and yeah. I see all the time who are people who have, um, let's say it's a 48-year-old man with no other risk factors who happens to have AFib and it's gone on for you know, 18 hours or, two, yeah. or, or a day. Do you really want to, there, there are no data of which I'm aware that says that person has to be on a month post cardio version, yeah. but you're sort of suggesting that's what the guidelines are going to tell us? Well, the guidelines don't make recommendations on how long it should be continued. It's more, they come in with AFEB, you know, even if their Chad's Vask is one, they've been in it for 12 hours. It's reasonable, that, you know, to give them a, have them swallow a NOAC or whatever before you do the cardioversion. And I know in my practice, I'll keep, have it going for a little bit of a tail, whether it's a week. Yeah, that would make sense. Three, Otherwise, yeah. you're not just, because if they had something in there, you yeah. want to cover them. But, uh, so that's not that, made as a yeah. policy statement, yeah. Yeah. just covering them. It just brings up that Got point. You. Uh, it also reminds us that the anticoagulation indications for a flutter is the same as a feb, right. uh, and then there's some tweaks on the ACS recommendations. You know, anticoagulation with stents and plavix and aspirin, okay. and that's that's not my forte, okay. if you will. So, so, but there was other members of the group so, that, and then another another issue came up was the Castel AF study. And where should catheter ablation of AFib be in heart failure patients? And that was basically left uh, as a 2B recommendation, uh, okay. you know, that it should be considered, uh, but it's not, it wasn't viewed as a strong enough of a study, despite being published in the New England Journal of Medicine, to give that a class one or a 2A recommendation. It was, you know, select, select patient group and so forth. We had a lot of people like Clyde Yancey as a member of the writing group, a big heart failure expert. So it really was, the voice of the heart failure community, I think, influenced okay. that in a, in a so, big way. So um, while you couldn't have taken this up in the committee because it wasn't published yet, uh, Cabana is now out there. And I know this isn't from the updated guidelines. This is just a personal thing. You and I have worked on, your, on the AFib ablation guidelines for years, and you've chaired that uh, for HRS, for example. Um, just personal opinion. Based on what you know, without a huge discussion about it, do you think it's reasonable, Hugh, to say that um, that ablation after the Cabana study is at least a reasonable discussion as an alternative to drugs, not preferred, yeah. but as an alternative without a dotted line? Yes, I mean, I think absolutely. I think the Cabana study was reassuring in terms of the safety of ablation, and again, strongly spoke to the value of ablation and you know, lowering AFib burden, improving quality of life, and then some of the hard endpoints also moved you know, in a favorable direction. So I think absolutely, I think that will impact the next round of you know, the complete rewrite of the ACC, right. HA, HRS guidelines, and then when the consensus documents gets redone, I would think the catheter ablation would move up from as first line therapy from a two way to a one. Right. You, you that's know, what I would hope. Kind of, yeah. I think that's where things are. So I know it's not there yet, but I just was curious to get your input. That's kind of where I sit now, having been been involved in, in, in at least in discussions of Cabana, that um, if nothing else, it's as safe, at least in the study. And if something's as safe and we know it's more effective in every study as far as keeping people in sinus, I think it should be part of a discussion to the patient, and it's always the patient's decision. Yeah. Don't you agree? Yes, it all comes down to this preferences, values. Yeah, exactly. And, and as you, long you as, as, long the as, option. as long yeah. as it's a fair discussion and you let the patient make a decision. Correct. Hugh, as always, right. thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, thank you.